Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Julia Roig from Partners Global. And uh, this is the last in a series of seven webinars that we've had on uh, different factors of civil society resiliency. And uh, if you're not familiar with Partners Global, we're based here in Washington, DC. We function as a network of uh, independent centers. Uh, we call our, our network members centers for change and conflict management around the world. And many of our colleagues are here, partners West Africa, Nigeria, partners um, in Argentina, partners Colombia, partners Yemen. And um, together, um, as a network and with peer organizations and adjacent um, fields, we developed a framework for thinking about civil society resiliency, initially um, intended for those organizations that are working in difficult um, political environments, um, but always um, thinking about how to shore up the organizations that are working for uh, democratic values, for citizen engagement, that are trying to promote um, an open society, and, um, and many of us are working under very difficult circumstances to maintain the role that civil society plays. And so it's not resiliency just um, for the sake of continuing to operate, but resiliency for the very important function that nonprofits play in a democratic um, society. And so I invite you to, to find out more about our framework and how um, we, we work on that. Um, my colleague, Ali, has, has put a link to the framework in the chat. And um, so just a couple of housekeeping rules before I turn it um, over to Rob. Um, we're really pleased to have Rob Rosigliano with us today to talk about uh, a systems mindset um, and how that really affects an organization's resiliency, especially in times of crisis and disruption. And um, we're, we're really privileged to have such an expert um, be talking with us about this particular subject. It's one of the most important factors we've found um, within uh, our entire framework. Um, that and how we stay connected with each other um, is another really important factor with regards to staying resilient. And so we're thrilled that you're all here with us. Um, we invite you to continue to be in relationship with partners um, and join kind of our, our resiliency um, uh, working kind of ecosystem, we'll call ourselves. And so please um, do um, put any thoughts or comments in the chat function. Um, I'd invite you to make sure that you have all panelists and attendees um, in your two kind of buttons. So if you'd like everyone else to see your questions, we're gonna hear from Rob for just a solid 20 or 30 minutes, partially because we are videotaping um, his presentation so that it'll also be available online. And then um, we'll get to the Q&A um, after, after his short presentation. And so please, you know, as they, as, um, they occur to you, put your uh, uh, questions in the chat and then I'll be able to um, kind of uh, beam back in uh, to, Rob's presentation and I'll just serve as a moderator of those questions. And so, um, you know, we always like to start off these sessions. We can't be super participatory because we're in this webinar format, but if you would like to turn on um, the two all panelists and attendees and let us know where you're coming from, whether it's just a state in the U.S. or a different country, would you mind just typing in the chat function, not the Q&A function, but the chat function so everybody can see it? just where you're coming from, um, because we usually have a quite a global audience for these discussions, and I think it's fun to see the diversity. Um, so we, I know that we are going to have a, a Wisconsin contingency, Rob, <laughs> because he's, he's beaming in from uh, Wisconsin, but we have Nigeria and we have Kenya, we have Toronto and Senegal um, connecting from London, but originally from Turkey. We have colleagues from Brazil, um, many different states in the US. Um, and nice to see Khadija from our partners colleagues in Senegal. Thank you for taking the time um, to be with us. And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob. So I'm gonna disappear, but I'll come back in just a little bit to, to help process and moderate your questions. Thanks, Julia. Um, and hi, welcome everybody um, to, to be on the webinar. And I. I uh, would love to be with you in person, but of course, that's uh, not, the, not the norm these days. 
Um, I'll, uh, I'm going to share my screen and start in with the slides. I just I want to say that um, the slides will go out with other resources after uh, the webinar today. So let me share the screen and then I will uh, get started. All right. Um, so uh, this is us. Yeah, you're in the right spot if this is what you're aiming to do. Um, I do want to say that the, the topic is interesting about systems thinking, crisis, and resilience. These are three, any two of those would have been a really interesting conversation, but the three together is kind of challenging. So I've, I've done my best to try to find a way to organize some thoughts in a relatively um, short format, knowing that uh, I'm going to be sort of flying at a fairly high altitude through a bunch of this and save it for the questions and perhaps some follow-ups afterwards uh, if, if people want to get into more specifics and there's other resources that you can look to that you'll, you'll have access to after the, the, the webinar. Um, I want to say a little bit about um, the, the Omidyar group. Um, uh, so the Omidyar group is a, is a family of, of uh, companies, organizations, initiatives, you know, more or less uh, uh, several of them are kind of look like fairly traditional uh, philanthropies. They're, they have a common donor, um, but they all have different organizations, different staff, different boards, um, and, and have their own missions, but are all kind of part of a community. Um, so we, we do share across the organizations. And that a subset of these organizations back in 2014 began bringing systems and complexity thinking into their work. And it has been uh, uh, a, a sort of joint endeavor uh, between me and, and I have a, a small team that is, is provides service throughout those organizations on issues of how to bring systems and complexity to bear on engaging these rel very large challenges like peace building or uh, forced labor and human trafficking, capitalism, um, uh, financial inclusion, etc. Uh, so it's, it's the, the, the insights I'm going to bring you are largely coming out of just the last almost six years now of lots of trial and error um, across these different organizations, across very different types of work and, and sectors. Um, I wanted to find a way to organize this, this sort of complex interaction between resilience, uh, crisis, and um, systems thinking. And so I, I'm, I, I'm going back to a framework that came out of Hope Lab, which is one of our organizations that, that focuses on um, human-centered design, technology, and uh, uh, well-being, especially um, teen uh, uh, well-being and health um, healthcare. And, and they, this came out of some research they did uh, a few years ago, where they really centered on these three factors around what drives individual resilience. I know Julie was talking about organizational and sort of community, sort of uh, higher levels of organization, but I think they still apply because um, those things are all, you know, uh, uh, driven by people. Um, so this was the things they felt affected individual resilience. The people that had uh, a deep sense of purpose, um, people that had deep connections with others around them, and people that had a sense of agency or that they could make a difference. So control is not meant in the sense of you know, like you're the controller of the world control, like megalomaniac control. It's actually just, I can, I have control over my bit of the world and I can do things to improve that part of my part of the world. Um, so if you take that framework and then look at um, what happens in a crisis. So I think what happens in a crisis is that short-term purpose increases or we're in a crisis urgency of issues is is greatly increased. Things are in your face that need urgent attention. So you have a sense of purpose in the short term. It tends to call into question those sort of longer term purpose. So for example, with, with both COVID and the, the sort of uh, protests for racial equity in the US recently, um, a lot of our organizations are saying, wow, you know, those long term, uh, you know, 10 year sort of goals that we set for ourselves or missions that we set for ourselves, we're not so sure anymore. Like, can we still do that? Is that the right goal to have? So I think that sense of purpose, especially on that sort of sense of deep purpose, long-term deep purpose, tends to get called into question a bit when you're in a crisis. And one of the things about having the increase in short-term purpose is you kind of get burnout because you, you accomplish one purpose, you meet one short-term challenge, and then of course, the next short-term challenge comes up. 
and, and you just kind of keep feeding on that and that eventually gets, gets people burned out. The sense of connection, um, I, again, in crisis, people tend to sort of um, pull into those that they're closest to, whether that's um, from, a, from a, a relationship sense or even a geographic sense. Um, they tend to get farther away from those that they differ with, who are the other. Um, when, when, as you know, in, in, in sort of higher conflict situations and crisis tends to uh, exacerbate the drivers of conflict, um, othering happens. And so people, you, people get pushed away who may not be a direct sort of support or might even be part of the, the conflict or the problem. And then in terms of control, I think this is the one where there's a pretty unambiguous sort of a decrease in sense of control. Like, so uh, people talked about uh, COVID here in the United States as being this time of hyper uncertainty. Um, and, and I think people never were as, could be as certain as they thought they were before, but it's even obviously worse than that. So without that, that level of uncertainty really decreases a sense that you can make a difference. You, you know what to do, you know where, how to act to advance your interests, to advance your, 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 your position. So how does systems thinking affect this? So I'm going to pull on a few tools and, and concepts that I think address these three things. So on, um, on purpose, um, I think systems thinking can help you clarify purposes, both in the short term and in the longer term, uh, and, and sort of in between. Um, it, it helps build connection. Um, so systems thinking has been described as the science of connection. Um, so it, it definitely helps you see connection to all kinds of things, to people, to issues, to environment, um, and almost regardless of geography, and oftentimes regardless of pre-existing power relationships, if it is implemented well. So participatory systems work can be a great leveler um, around power dynamics, which, which often tend to, to play out in, often in, to, to the, the, the injury of many in, in a crisis. And then around control, I think it helps you understand what you can control. And it, it sort of takes away the feeling of, I'm not, it shows you those places where you, you'll be just banging your head against a wall if you try to address a certain type of issue in a certain way. It helps you apply the right approach to the nature of the problem you're confronting. And I think that's what helps give people agency. So again, all three of these, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delve into uh, uh, much more. Um, uh, the, um, so on, um, sorry, uh, on um, purpose and agency, uh, a couple of um, kind of core concepts around systems and complexity thinking that I think are helpful. Um, I, when I'm sharing my screen, I, I'm not seeing the, the chat box, so uh, I apologize if, um, if, if there's a chat or something, Julie or Allie, if you guys want to break in, if there's something, otherwise I'm just going to go um, and uh, uh, assume folks are kind of along for the ride, or at least uh, well enough. Um, so the core, to get at this core idea, core concept around complexity that I think is helpful, it's useful to answer this question, which is if you look at the problems that are on list one, feeding hungry people, making home energy efficient, building system of levities, marketing a new product, holding an election, and the problems on list two, uh, ensuring food security, building a sustainable energy system, combating climate change, um, building a sustainable business, fostering a healthy democracy. How are those two lists of problems different? Problems on list one, problems on, on list two. And this is where I wish I could see if people had thought they wanted to put into the chat. Um, uh, so if I can see that, I can't see that. Um, uh, just take a minute and think about how those two things are different. So, uh, assuming, as with most, most groups, people are starting to see some sort of consistent differences between those, the different ways in which they're different. Um, the, the list one problems are what um, Dave Snowden, who is a leading complexity theorist or going way back to the 60s, Karl Popper, who's a philosopher of science, would call complicated in Snowden's terms problems. They're still difficult. It's still hard to feed lots of hungry people but they are solvable, they are fixable. We can feed those people. We know how to feed people. We may not always have the resources or the access to the political will to do it, but we, we, we know how to actually address that problem. Um, widespread, widespread food security is a whole different kind of problem. It is 
not necessarily solvable. Um, you could have food security one day, but have food not have food security the next day. It's an infinite type of a challenge. Um, so these two lists, um, I like Karl Popper's terms for them, which are list one is clock problems. They work like clocks. And list two are cloud problems. They work like clouds. So what, is that, what does that look like? Um, so cloud problems are predictable, they're controllable, and they're bounded. So we, there are certain people hungry, they're gonna be hungry for a period of time. They're hungry now, at some point later, if we can address this problem, they will not be hungry. We know how to actually solve that problem. Um, List two, the cloud problems, are unpredictable. They're very hard to control. Um, they're endless and evolving. So food security, for example, is, is not something that's gonna be um, uh, easily solvable. You can shift it. You can move to systems which actually have produce less food insecurity or produce more food security. Um, if you think something like racial equity, um, it, 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 we, 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 yeah, I mean, some of the stuff we could predict, but a lot of it we can't. We can try to address it, but new things are going to emerge, new challenges are going to emerge all the time. And because the world is not, does not come pre-labeled clock or cloud, or I'm 80% clock and 20% cloud, you have this, what we unusefully call the murky middle, which is where it's not really clear whether a situation is more clock or cloud or how to address it. The fundamental import, import of this is that the ways you address clock problems are fundamentally different than the ways you address cloud problems. So problems on the, a clock problem solved directly, you deploy a product or service to solve that problem. You bring in food if there's, if there's people are hungry. Um, cloud problems are, are resolved indirectly, but you can't get your hands on it. You're actually trying to affect the ecosystem that produced that situation. So what is this broader system that produces racial inequity or food insecurity? And how do we affect those sort of complex, morphing, dynamic forces that interact in ways that produce those outcomes? And what if you, if you wanted to sort of think about how that looks? Uh, a clock uh, uh, problem is much more, um, approach is much more direct. It's a technical approach. It's a known problem and a known solution. And the very basic ones are, are, are pretty linear. Cloud looks like this, right? So, it, and that might be a generous sort of depiction of the sort of wild ball of string going in multiple directions. It, it, it is an emergent, ongoing, long-term type of, of way to address things. We try to take that basic insight and, and make it a little more concrete. So we developed this sort of continuum of approaches. So any situation, you can think of ways to engage at any one of these four levels. So uh, a targeted uh, solution is where you're, you're aiming to direct, you're aiming to solve a bounded problem like bringing in food aid to a particular people at a particular time. Solutions at scale are much, uh, they're, they're, they're less time bound. They are trying to solve a problem for a large group of people for a longer period of time. Uh, innovation in the system is you're not trying to change the whole system. You're just trying to change a problematic pattern or force in that system. And systems transformation is we're actually trying to change the system itself. So that's where we're dealing with much more complex interconnected forces and how do we affect those. Um, just to get, make it a little more concrete again, just to take the current racial, uh, predators for racial equity here in the United States. So a targeted solution might look like, how, how can we hold individual bad actors accountable? Can we prosecute the police involved in the George Floyd killing, for example? Um, how do we aid victims? Do we bring, how do we help their families? Um, because they just lost this in communities, so they just they just suffered this traumatic loss. A solution at scale might look like widespread policy reform. So the state of New York, for example, has, has put forward a uh, package of police reform that would apply to all police uh, agencies within the state of New York. And then there are similar legislation at the federal level. You can see that that would apply to a, a much broader scale. It's not focused on an individual or a group of individuals. It's much broader. Um, it moves to defund the police where we change how we fund police and what we fund with the police is also a sort of an idea of an example of a solution at scale. Systems innovation would be, look at some of the dynamics that propelled the, even just the George Floyd situation. 
Um, how do we break a persistent pattern of impunity for police when they kill black suspects? There's a, there's a pattern there. There's a, there's a set of forces there. The, the, in the George Floyd situation, there were several police officers who witnessed the nine minutes in which George Floyd was pinned to the ground and had his neck um, uh, constrained and eventually died and didn't do anything, did not intervene. Why is that? Is it just those few people and their pr particular character? Probably not. It's probably a deeper force, it's an attitude, it's a mental model, it's a set of feelings that is driving people to be that way. Can we find out what that pattern is and try to break that pattern? Systems transformation would say, hey, you know, the, the roots of racial inequity are political, they're economic. It has to do with how our capitalist system is set up. Um, they're, they're cultural, they're deep social forces. There's intergenerational trauma. There's institutional racism. I mean, there are, there are these issues that are bigger and broader. Now you can sort of see that, you can see these different levels of, of challenge and approach here. What's interesting about this is we're much better at the two uh, pieces on the left side of this, targeted solutions and solutions at scale, than we are at the stuff that's on the right. And what we've been trying to do with the Namidia and many others have been trying to do is figure out what are the tools? How do we get as good at that level, even though it's, it's a very different kind of process, it's never gonna be as cut and dry and clean as what you have on the left side of the scale, but we can be better at it. And, and how do we do that? What are the skills, the tools, the mindsets we need to, to, to do that well? Um, and that's what I wanna sort of focus on here is what are some of the things that we know about how to engage that right side of the scale? Um, one other sort of, I think, key dynamic I want to point out is um, if you look at a life cycle, life cycle of a system, and this goes back to sort of, for me, fundamental purpose. Um, this is the adaptive cycle. Many of you may know this with just slightly different vocabulary, but basically it's saying if you follow this around, you, you start at, let's go to the bottom left, you have a, a growth, you have an ecosystem where the plants and animal life is growing and it's, it's, it's developing and new species are emerging. And eventually things stop growing um, and they, they kind of, things maintain. So the, we're not getting new species, we're not getting new plants. Uh, the water is kind of just maintaining, it's not growing. Um, eventually as the environment begins to change, maintenance tips into disruption where, okay, now they can't quite actually hold on to what they had before. And, and ideally I, disruption leads into reorganization. So uh, animals adapt, plant life adapts and they begin to find new ways to exist. And those new ways actually lead to a new period of growth. And I think all systems, human and natural, um, or, or other natural systems, social and, and systems, kind of can follow this as well. Um, what happens in periods, like if we take the, the racial inequity protests now, um, what happens with race over time, at least in the United States, where we keep coming back to the same, we're, we're sort of spinning our wheels here, right? We keep coming back to the same set of conversations, these same protests. And I would say it's largely due to the fact that if disruption is not channeled into reorganization, fundamental reorganization, uh, then you, you tip back to the status quo. So you just have this sort of bouncing back and forth between maintenance, status quo, and disruption. And it, it sort of peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. And I think one of my diagnoses for this is that often what you need or sometimes what you need to get from disruption into reorganization is a systems approach. You either need systems innovation or systems transformation. And if we are not as good as those, those ways of engaging, right, we are gonna find ourselves stuck in certain situations that really require fundamental systems change to move from disruption into reorganization and eventually perhaps into growth. Um, so I, in this situation, I think it's one of my prime sort of feelings is that our, what we see in the U.S. is the fact that we're stuck in a disruption maintenance cycle and we haven't been able to tip into reorganization, I think largely because of the difficulty of taking a systems approach. Um, going quickly, I realize, so I'll take a breath, which I, as a, as a, growing up in a large Italian family, you don't, you speak without taking a breath. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some of the tools, the mindsets, the tools, the processes that you can use. Uh, again, these, I'm gonna fly over these. It's not gonna be an in-depth um, uh, consideration of these. Um, so these are the four mindsets that we really uh, began to articulate as we were talking to our people within a mid-year about what is different about taking a systems approach. 
And I, I'm not going to cover these in depth. There's a, a video that we can send you a link to that goes into more depth on this. Uh, the key one for me is the first one. Uh, so we seek health, not mission accomplished. So uh, losing weight, you can think of when I lose 10 pounds, mission accomplished. Living a healthy lifestyle, having a healthy body is an always a constant. So we think about systems as not being about are they fixed or not fixed, because systems aren't broken or are they fixed. They are what they are. They are infinite. Um, they do what they do. We can try to make them healthier. So we should seek to improve the health of a system uh, and therefore the, the outcomes it produces than necessarily sort of solving a system. We need to see patterns, not problems. The, there's a, a system thinker uh, that I love named George Richardson who um, defines, he, he says a systems view stands back from reality just far enough to deliberately blur discrete events into patterns of behavior. We can't engage those deeper systems forces if we can't see them. And seeing patterns is the way we start to get a sense of what are the deeper forces at play that we need to begin to act on to either amplify or disrupt in order to change the system. Um, unlock change, don't impose it. Uh, systems, we, we, our mantra internally is that systems change best when systems change themselves. And the, the things that are needed to change that system are in the system. You cannot impose an external fix on a system. If it's not indigenous, if it's not in part of that system, it will not be sustainable. Um, so you, we try to, try to unlock change, not impose that change. And, and the philanthropic world is full of approaches where they try to impose it. They get a great solution, they take it from someplace and try to plop it down somewhere else, and it often doesn't work. Um, plan to adapt, don't stay the course. It doesn't mean don't plan. Planning is still essential. It's don't make a plan that you're gonna to stick to come hell or high water. It's build a plan that is built to change. And there are certain key ingredients on how you, you build plans so that you, you don't develop a, whether it's an implicit sort of psychological attachment to that plan, we're gonna to stick to it no matter what, or it's an explicit, the way we succeed here is if we stick to the plan at all costs. Um, it's different than that. You build plans that, are, that are, um, help you increase the probability that you're actually gonna understand and engage the system well. Those four mindsets, I think, are critically different than how at least we had operated as a traditional um, set of philanthropies. Um, some of you may know some of these tools or concepts. Um, uh, again, you'll get the slide. You can, you can look this stuff up if it's not familiar to you, but the idea in that the middle, upper, middle, linear versus circular, like that's a key com uh, uh, distinguishing factor about systems thinking. Everything is a cause and an effect. Uh, everything is it's knowing that there's this connection the lower left seeing um, uh, not just events, but patterns. So knowing what is behind the events that you see. Uh, and then the, the, the lower right, um, static versus dynamic. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in the peace building and development world and people love to take a picture of a, of a country or a community and say, here's the needs as of X date. And then it, they'll, they'll take, you know, between six months and 18 months to develop a grant program. And then they take another six months to implement it. And they pretend like the static picture they took two years ago is still what's happening now. And it's not, right, because of things are in motion. So system thinking is a way of sort of accounting for that motion and seeing that motion and planning around that and planning to work with that, that dynamism that's in a system. Um, one of the patterns that I wanted to call out that I think is particularly relevant to the sort of race protest for racial equity that we see in the US now is what's known as a fix that fails, where you, you apply a short term fix that in the long term ends up actually making the problem worse. So in, in this case, it might be something like you, 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 you have some relatively high profile racial abuses that leads to widespread deep protests, which may actually reduce the amount of racial abuse that you see in the shorter term or in the medium term. The problem is that a lot of those protests, uh, as constructive as they are in the short term, end up actually over the longer term, decreasing the pressure for a deep change. So that the sustained level of effort, the widespread coalition that forms to do the protests doesn't stay intact to actually then work for the longer term change that takes uh, a, a lot more effort is a lot more difficult. Um, and so over the long term, as the protests die down, the pressure for long term change dies down, you just create the environment where the racial abuse comes back. Um, 
And so this is the kind of thing around systems innovation. We'd want to, how do we break this cycle? How do we, how do we at least, whether it's our community, um, try to be aware of the cycle and then, and then find ways to, to change it. Um, this is a, a list, I'm, I'm, I'm not even, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scratch the surface of this one, but just for you, I just created a bit of, a, of an inventory. I think of various tools that you can use that go for more uh, uh, like easier, um, helpful in the clock-like situations, the ones that are uh, much more complicated, but much better suited to the very difficult cloud type uh, engagements and ones that work kind of in that space in between. Uh, again, you, you, can, you can follow up on this and, and there's lots of resources to get on those. So um, don't frantically write this down at this point. Um, lastly, I wanted to focus on this idea of connection, of how systems processes can help build connection. Um, we do a lot of participatory systems mapping here and, and for, it doesn't work for targeted solutions, but for solutions at scale, innovation, systems innovation, systems transformation, it's really a helpful foundation especially if those in the system or key actors in that system are the ones doing the mapping. So this is just a few pictures of this process, which is sort of, uh, we've, we've, we've written a, a workbook on and it, it, it's, we have a course that helps teach this. Um, but it's a way to bring community together. And I've seen it level power imbalances uh, in ways I never expected that I would have, I really appreciated as someone who did a lot of conflict resolution and peace building work. Um, but just creating this platform where, where voices are relatively equal, um, you bring, you need diverse perspectives in the room. That's the value of this, is diverse perspectives. And you create an environment, you create a space where people can actually work through the differences in their perspectives. And it's not about judging or picking one. It's about understanding why we are where we are. And part of why we are where we are is that people have different perspectives. And you can't discount one because you don't like it or because you don't think it's part of the solution. Um, if you're really trying to understand what's happening in the system as an initial diagnosis, you just want to know what is there, what, what's present and how is it working? How is it affecting each other? And that's what this mapping process does. And when you get a, a community to do this, they become aware of their community as a complex system, which is the first step toward change. And it's the last thing I want to leave with around agency, which was, um, the Waters Foundation, uh, which has some great resources on, for systems thinking, does a lot of work in, uh, with students in, in middle schools and high schools. And, and this was a community, uh, the school I visited in Milwaukee, a middle school, uh, predominantly, predominantly African-American neighborhood. And what they found was that the, the students that were involved in their systems thinking program, they began to see other indicators of, of uh, educational you know, uh, performance increase. So their attendance went up disciplinary problems went down, grades went up. And as they dug into this, they basically found that taking a systems view helps people see basically the system they were trapped in. So a lot of the things that they internalized and said, well, it's, it's our fault that we are, name it, we have violence in our community, there's poverty in my community, et cetera. We're like, actually, no, we're in a system. I have some, I've, I play some part in that, but we're in a system that's producing these types of outcomes. And I, I now both see it for what it is, and that helps me understand how to engage it. Um, and it, it, it made it easier. So it just gave them a sense of agency, which sort of reduced stress and improved these other, other um, indicators of, of educational performance, which is really interesting. Uh, not necessarily what they started out to do, but ended up being a really great impact of that program. Um, uh, you'll get this list as well, but just ways to kind of continue to, to sort of dig in and learn. I, I think it's all these things Anytime we do this kind of a talk, I would want people to think of this as the start of a process, wherever you are, if it's at the beginning of understanding systems thinking or you're, you're well, pretty far along, hopefully there's some things in here you can take and, and find a way to take that next step in your, in your learning process. Um, Julia, I think I'm gonna stop the formal uh, presentation there and um, hand it over to questions. Julia, I think you might be muted. I, I was just about to congratulate you that um, you definitely win a prize for like the best on time presentation to have enough chance to get um, everybody's questions in. So <laughs> bravo on the very succinct um, presentation. And I just want to acknowledge for those of, if you've never been exposed to these 
concepts, I, I, it is a little, it's a lot. Um, and so please know that if everyone who RSVP'd for the session um, will be getting the slides, will be getting a lot of additional resources, um, or links. So, you know, don't worry um, if it feels a little overwhelming to kind of process. And um, we did ask some folks when they RSVP'd if they had any initial questions. And so I'm gonna start with those. And then, as I said, I'm gonna invite you, please, um, uh, if you, we didn't have any questions during your presentation, I think people were probably paying attention intently. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please, I invite you to put them in the, um, the chat, not the Q&A, but the chat. Um, but I, I'm going to ask a couple of the questions that um, people started out with sure. in registration, Rob. One of them, you know, it, as practitioners who who do a lot of kind of stakeholder engagement and you know work with with communities and that and they're used to a lot of um, participation, we we got a really I thought thoughtful question about like yes and how do you manage when there's too many kind of cooks in the kitchen? <laughs> to try and and get things done um, because I you know I, I also wanted to ask you and maybe I'm going to generalize that very specific question like what are the barriers to working this way and then how do you kind of try and kind of overcome those barriers and this concept of too many cooks in the kitchen you know is a is a real life challenge yeah. for those of yeah. us yeah. practitioners yeah we um we learn uh, uh we we face that challenge a lot with our teams and we 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 um so we have a sort of a four step kind of systems journey that we had to add a step to so it was like the steps were sort of um like uh understand your system um you know get some clarity on what is your system uh look for opportunities where you can have a potentially high leveraged impact act strategically, learn and adapt, and repeat. So it's gain clarity, find leverage, act strategically, learn and adapt, right? We had to add launch, which was the first step, um, which was basically, and part of that launch part was um, some of the actor mapping, but also just build, build your sort of, your, your sort of uh, administrative infrastructure, basically. So you have a core team that is small and is doing, is really the ones getting their hands dirty with most of the work. And all, they are the ultimate kind of decision-making body or, or, or the day-to-day -day decision-making body, I should say. There is uh, an extended team, which can include some of the decision-makers. In our case, decision-makers within the organization or could be decision-makers in the community. But they're the ones who are active, very active, but they're not the ones running the day-to-day -day process. And then you have an extent, you have a participants, which would be folks you'd bring in for your bigger public consultation type type session. And it, it, it takes a lot of really careful thought, actually, to think about who should be on the core team, who should be on the extended team, and who shouldn't be, and um, who, who is at that participant level. Um, and, and then sort of um, kind of make that clear from the start. So people kind of understand what their roles are in, in the process. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to, so we try to deal with the too many cooks in the kitchen by letting people cook at the right times um so it's not either you're a cook or not a cook it's there's these different layers of cook so each one you can think of is involved in the cooking at some point yeah um, but you just want to be very clear about when and for what purpose and a lot of people who probably are not really helpful as the core team oftentimes say oh yeah i'd rather be extended team don't put me on the core team i i, I don't want to i don't want to learn we use kumu as our mapping software i don't want to learn kumu like I, yeah um yeah, so, so I think that's the way, just trying to find the right roles for people so they can be engaged and be active, but not, you know, have it be all or nothing. Yeah, great. Um, and, you know, I, my colleague who's, who's kind of behind the scenes on the Zoom call is a big Kumu um, fan, so I might ask her to put a, a link to it in the chat just so people know the, the mapping software that you use, because we try and use it as well. Um, so you, another question then, and I'll get to Terry's question about unlocking change. I think that's a really big one. But while we're here with regards to designing the way to implement and who implements what, you know, we also had a question just about leadership um, of an organization and how you kind of, so a leader may see the need for this type of work um, or, you know, maybe, you know, working with it, their teams, 
to kind of embed this thinking and um, you know, it's really hard to introduce these concepts into an organization, especially for civil society who are our entire ecosystem pushes us not to work in this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we've got grants yeah. and we've got deliverables. And um, so how, what advice would you have for leaders in the sector yeah. to try it's, to um, Yeah, this is, this is the question which like I both uh, think is the most important question and I also kind of dread in, in a sense because what we found with our organizations was we could get teams to understand the mindsets and use the tools and 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 um, uh, the processes. And the better they got at it, the more they bumped into their organizational processes, like their existing ones. And and so this is a bit. I, I'm I'm kind of kind of extrapolating the question a little bit. So it it is about leadership, but it's also about kind of organizational structure and culture. Yeah. Um, because we had leaders who were incredibly visionary and really wanting to push this change really fast and really far. And I loved working with them until I realized we were way out on the limb together and no one else was. And so it's like, we have to think about this differently. We have to think more consciously about how we, where is our, um, how is our organization set up to engage in this very kind of uh, nimble and emergent way and where is it not? We talk about what are your headwinds and your tailwinds as an organization and getting a sense of what those are. So having a learning culture, for example, is a great um, uh, tailwind. Um, having a very explicit uh, tied in uh, quantitative metric system for measuring results is a, is a headwind. Um, you know, uh, uh, so there, we, 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 in some of the stuff that we've written, we've, we talk about what these headwinds and tailwinds are. And I'm, I'm working on a series now that actually gets into how you need to be different as an organization and mm -hmm. what's the process you go through to get there. So the, the, without going deeply into that, I would say the, the, there's this two-pronged leadership challenge. So the one is how do we engage the complexity externally, which is using a lot of the tools and the processes that we've just talked about. And the second leadership challenge or, or task is how do we have a conversation internally about what we aspire to be as an organization, how we aspire to act, who we aspire to be in the world, the kind of change we want to have, how we want to show up for those that we work with. Um, and then how do we sort of start to think about how are we not what we aspire to be? Mm -hmm. uh, if we want this change in the world, what do we have to be to do that? And where are we now? And how do we bridge that gap? And so just in a, that's easier, much easier said than done, but it is the essential sort of start. Yeah, I, um, thank you for acknowledging that it's definitely easier said than done. And yet I think even just seeing all of the folks that are on the, the call are committed to at least exploring it um, with their team. So um, there's two kind of big questions um, that we received that um, I wanna make sure that um, we talk a little bit more about the difference between unlocking change um, and and those who maybe are kind of within, you know, trying to push for change. Um, and especially, yeah. you know, within the international development yeah. sector, you know, we have agendas and we're working yeah. very respectfully with our local partners. And yet, yeah. you know, to a certain extent, we are pushing for change. I don't know if there's an example that you have that you can give us about what is unlocked change look like yeah. Um, in practice. Yeah, so, so differentiate a little a bit from sort of advocacy, which mm -hmm. can, uh, so advocacy could be a solution at scale, which you lead to a solution at scale, which is totally the right choice. So, so I, I wanted to sort of hive that off and say, there are times when that is exactly what you ought to do. And that is basically an end in itself, at least, at least the sort of policy changes and so on that advocacy is, is, is seeking. Um, when you look at the in the systems change context, you, you sort of nest advocacy within um, a broader sort of systems change strategy. And then the piece about unlock change is, um, are, there, are there those in the system that resonate with the same values you're trying to promote through your advocacy? So the idea of unlock change is it, it, it's gotta be resident in the system. You can lift it up, you can empower it, um, uh, but it, 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 if it's not there, it's going to be really hard to make it there. And even if there aren't people who are willing to, it, it, you know, if, for example, let's say the rights of women are, are at a very, very low level in a particular society and it's part, deep 
part of their culture, um, are there at least those who are willing to question that? And how do you work with those? So the unlock change is more about how than what. So it's about how do you work with communities? How do you work with people in the system? Um, it, you know, and, we, and I used to do the, the mediation and peace building work. It was so much better, a, a, a potential new idea or option was much more likely to be implemented if one of the participants suggested it rather than us. And I might ask a series of questions that might sort of bring people closer to that, but I, I don't want to be the one to suggest it because it's, it's, it almost inherently reduces its, its likelihood that it's actually going to be implemented or implemented successfully. So are there, are there ways in which these ideas, these capacities, this energy can be harnessed, identified and harnessed from within the system? And that's, and that's why we do a lot of the participatory, participatory mapping stuff, because once people see a system, they then say, oh, here, I want to work on this. And rather than us saying, hey, you guys should really be doing this, um, it's, it's sort of clear for folks, there's a bit of consensus that emerges around what they ought to do as a group. And, and it's just, it's, it's indigenous to them. It's not external to us. And more likely than not, what we thought was a good idea actually wasn't such a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it also kind of corrects for that. So that actually leads us very nicely into the question that we got about um, maybe some more detail about the nuts and bolts around what that systems mapping actually looks like. Um, because you know, I know that you've really got a methodology around the way you ask the question, the way that you look at the um, kind of causation and um, can you talk a little bit? Yeah. I, yeah, I know it's- Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say, um, so I, 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 we, as you said, we, we've got a workbook and a, a, a course from Plus Acumen that will kind of walk people through this, this very particular form. And just want to say, it is not the only form. So that this, is a, this is under the broad rubric of system sensing and sense making. So those are the key things, right? Those are the things, whichever group, whether it's your internal team or it's the community that you're working with, the more that that unit can sense their system as a complex system and then make sense of it and how to engage it. That's the core idea. Yeah. Um, now, the what, way we do it is we, we um, try to get very specific about like this stuff is it's very hard to get this work. Like there's it's actually a big administrative logistical challenge to do this. So, so you have to sort of start with some of that. That's that launch phase is what are the, what are the, what are the ways in which you, um, get organized for this and get different people organized in different ways. Um, how, do you, how do you build a structure that, that can um, ensure that kind of the trains keep running, but also is very open and very able to shift intact based on what you're learning and the, the, the challenges and the opportunities that you arise with. So we do a basic structure where we take whatever big goal you have and turn it into a framing question for trying to understand a system. So um, the one that's always at the top of my mind is, is the, the team that at Humanity United that, that did slavery and corporate supply chain. So the question they asked was, what are the forces that uh, account for the current level of slavery in corporate supply chain? Open-ended question, but it, it's basically telling you what is the system you want to try to understand. And then step two is what enables or inhibits slavery in corporate supply chain? So what are the big, very broad brush. Is without, without putting the blinders on, think broadly, think expansively, get diverse voices in the room. Um, that helps you then say, okay, of that big universe of potential enablers and inhibitors, what are the key, um, what are the most important ones, at least that we feel? And most important is not measured necessarily by we did two years of quantitative study. It, a lot of it is just intuitive and it takes advantage of both ways of knowing, the quantitative, but also the ones that resonate strongly with people and in their hearts, they think that is my life. I want that for me is my reality. I want to dig into that. And so we, we sort of broad get narrow on some core themes and then we go broad again and say, what are all the things that drive that? So if it's lack of, if it's uh, the fact that corporate supply chains are incredibly purposely opaque so people can not actually detect slavery, why is that? What, what are the, all the forces that, drive opaqueness in supply chains. And when you have opaqueness in supply chains, what are all the things that affect? We call this upstream downstream. Um, and then once you do that, you've actually begun building feedback loops or patterns. So you, you now have three things that are connected. It's uh, upstream cause, 
the opaqueness and supply chain and a downstream impact of opaqueness. And then with a little work, you start to say, well, what are the patterns here? What are the things we're seeing over and over again? And that's the process of building feedback loops, but ultimately defining what are the key patterns. And then the last part, which is right where your brain really gets close to being on tilt, if not a little over, is you, you might get, you know, we've had groups produce like 60 of these feedback loops or 40 of them. And they say, you know, take that and I'll step back. And what are the 10 most important feedback loops? What are the ones that are the most impactful that are connected? How are, they, how are the feedback loops connected to each other? So you'll go from this very broad set of feedback loops and forces down to something more narrow, which might be between 10 and 20 or 25. And that becomes a map. And the importance of a map is just as a feedback loop connects individual factors into a causal relationships, a map connects loops into causal relationships. So it's what are the connections amongst the, the forces? And then that's when it gives you a sense, at least a hypothesis, probably wild and inaccurate, but still much better than where you were to start the process of where might there be opportunities for a higher leveraged impact? What patterns should we disrupt? What should we, should we enable? Um, and that's, that's where you then more from doing the, the sort of mapping into building a, mm -hmm. a systemic strategy or an emergent strategy. Um, for how to engage the system. That's a quick flyover. I hope that's somewhat yeah. helpful. And having participated in several of these, you know, I know it's, you know, that was a really quick synopsis. And, but it, I, I also just want to highlight the point that you made in the beginning of just the more diversity you have in the room to do the mapping process, you know, the more rich that analysis and the hypothesis yeah. will be. And then, and then, you know, the, you're going to kind of evaluate the, the disruption with your colleagues, um, right? So that the process of even evaluating whether the disruption is is really making a change in the system, you can't do that alone because you're just one set of eyes. So yeah, um, yeah. just to highlight that point because I think it's really important. And, and, and maps are maps are only as good as the voices represented in the map. Yes. And, and uh, one of the things that we, with all of our teams, even with that have, ones that have done very participatory mapping processes. They, at the end of that sort of first stage of participatory work, they say, ah, we had the wrong voices in the room. We didn't have all the voices we needed in the room. Now we know who we need. And, and, and that just always happens. But then it's great because then they go out and they get more people involved, get more voices in, into the map. So Rob, listen, we only have about eight minutes left. Um, we did have, a, a, I think, a, a good final question, which is, you know, you were talking about um, maybe one of the, the headwinds to this type of work within an organization, having too strict of um, metrics that we measure our work by. Yeah. And yet, you know, we all want to make sure that, that we're a learning organization. Yeah. And so how do you have a way of helping organizations measure how well they're doing at systems practice? Sure. Yeah. yeah, there's been a lot of really good work, uh, I would say both by our, uh, some of the teams within our mid-year organizations on this very question. Um, you know, and I work also with our, our uh, governors who, who are sit on the boards for how do they make sense of impact. Um, and then of course, a lot of people mostly outside of TOG uh, have done some great work. The, the Center for Evaluation and Innovation, Julia Kaufman, Tony Beer, some great stuff. Um, so the, 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 a few things. One is um, you start to change what you measure. So uh, people talk about how do you, not only measuring, you can measure the, so the traditional forms of measurement and evaluation are good, still good for the immediate proximate program impact. So if you think about a few levels of change and impact. So one level is what's the, what are the immediate impacts uh, or outcomes of the work that we did? So if we, um, implemented a program to training community nurses because we wanted to lower infant mortality in some, you know, maybe a two-year period of whatever. Did that happen? Um, mm -hmm. Did we get that outcome? The second level is, um, do we have evidence or what evidence do we have that in decreasing infant mortality and increasing the number of, of trained uh, nurses in communities started to impact deeper forces in the system? Did it start to disrupt or empower um, forces? So did it, did it break uh, the, 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 the pattern where people sought, took risk to seek medical care or uh, engaged in 
risky economic activity in order to, to pay for medical care, that it begin to break some of those patterns. And the third level is what's the system doing overall? So what's the level of well-being of the people in that system or that community? So one is immediate program outcomes, two is impacts to deeper forces or patterns in the system. And the third level is just big systemic outcomes. And the, the hard part here is the further we move out of that chain, the far more attenuated our connection to it is. So we probably can almost one-to-one -one say, we trained these people in this community and they did this, this, and this. That's pretty much, we did, it happened. When you start to get to deeper forces, the level of complexity kicks up, the dynamism kicks up. Um, so we can maybe measure contribution mm -hmm. to some of those changes. When we get to big, deep system outcomes, we cannot, I mean, maybe we can see correlation, but we're, we're, we're getting farther and farther away. So we, people love to take advantage of, oh, you know, these big, we, we, um, we did this and it lowered uh, level of, of slavery globally by X amount. And that's a really hard claim um, from a systems view when you realize the number of things that intervene in, to create that. Um, so yeah, so it, 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 it's, it's changing how we measure and what we measure. Looking at things like learning outcomes as being things we measure. Actually, it's an outcome thing we can, we can sort of gauge. And the last thing I'll say is, is that um, we, doing true systems transformation means we have to measure both how we are and not just what we do. So how are we showing up, uh, both as individuals, as teams, as organizations, as networks? Because um, that you, we we can get a sense of are we increasing the probability of something happening versus knowing we we did X and and Y happened. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's about changing how you, what you measure how you measure it. Um, and and I, I would say just pick out what you said. The more you're doing this as a network, as a community, as a participatory process, that ha that is the same for monitoring and evaluation and learning. Right. It's even better when we have it. It's more participatory. Yeah, and that's a great place to end, Rob, because I would also just add to that final point, um, measuring and reporting on who you're doing it with, I, I think is a is a worthy yeah. metric. <laughs> and, you know, for those of us who really believe in those relationships for the long term kind of systems change that we want to make those unlikely bedfellows that are going to come together and grapple with the system and continue to grapple with the system, just bring, making those relationships, you know, stronger is, is, a, is a worthwhile um, goal. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, um, Rob. That was just fantastic. And um, thank you to all of you for, for joining us.